Hello, welcome to our Mass of the Ages live stream. Uh, on this stream, we take deep dives into all things Latin Mass. I'm Cameron O'Hearn. I'm the director of the upcoming documentary, Mass of the Ages, How Tradition Will Restore the Church. We're doing a documentary that's equal parts beautiful, inspiring, and surprising. So we're featuring the Latin Mass in its glory, in its beauty, putting you know the best professionals and the best gear to the test to feature the Latin Mass um, as it should be featured. We're also showing stories of traditional Catholics from all over the country and even all over the world. And we're conducting an, a surprising investigation into the changes to the, new, to the Mass um, after Vatican II. If you want to hear more about that, the best way to do that is to join our mailing list because uh, we don't know uh, <laughs> what's going to happen with social media or this channel in the future, but the best way to just stay in touch is to, is to get notified uh, through email. So you can do that at our, at our uh, brand new website, uh, theliturgy.org. Um, today I'm joined by Father John Zulsdorf, better known as Father Z, and Angela Lill. Um, Angela is a PhD candidate in political philosophy at the University of Dallas. She founded RomanRoots.com to inspire love of Catholic tradition and robust communities. She also runs the Instagram account at Roman Roots. She attends the Latin Mass with her husband and two children. Father Z is a Catholic priest living and working in Wisconsin. He runs a well-renowned blog titled, What Does the Prayer Really Say? And is active on Twitter at Father Z. His writing has become the go-to source on traditional Catholic topics, especially the liturgy. So again, this channel. Um, so firstly, welcome guests, Angela, Father Z. Thank you so much for, for taking time out of your schedule busy being a priest, busy being a mom, <laughs> and you're, you're talking on this channel with me this morning. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, by the way, uh, the blog is called Father Z's blog. It hasn't been called What Does the Prayer Really Say for 10 years, maybe? Oh, I see. Well, we're, we're stuck in the past. So <laughs> the modern title is <laughs> Father Z's blog. Um, that's great. Well, we'll, at the end, we'll, we'll put up a screenshot of your blog and everyone can find out. Oh, Father Z online. You have it right there too. So yeah, we'll, we'll promote it at the end too. So people will be able to find it. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. And thank you for that introduction, Cameron. I'll just add to that. My, um, uh, my Instagram handle is our Roman roots. <laughs> Sorry. Got it. We'll update that. There. So <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get that up too at the okay. end. Thanks for that. <laughs> So again, we take deep dives into all things Latin Mass. Um, the question on the table today is, um, is Latin overrated? And uh, we'll start off just with opening introductions to Angela and Father Z. Uh, we'd love to hear about, firstly, because we talk about the Latin Mass, it's all things Latin Mass. We'd love to hear how you discovered the Latin Mass. Um, and then we can get into the topic of Latin in the Mass. So who would like to go first? Ladies first. <laughs> All right. Um, so actually, my story of how I found the Latin Mass plays right into, day, to, into today's topic. Um, it was the Latin, actually, that both attracted me to the Latin Mass and repelled me away for a little while. Um, so I'll just I'll explain what I mean there. Um, my first Latin Mass was about 10 years ago now. I was an undergrad in college and I had been attending a daily Novus Ordo Mass. And this daily Mass used a lot of Latin. Um, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, uh, Marian hymns, and so on were done in Latin. And I was in drawn to the austerity and otherworldliness of the Latin. And I noticed a striking difference between the Latin that was used in the daily mass and the, the English um, on Sunday masses. Um, can you still hear me? My, I think my connection is. Oh yeah, you're, you're, you're fine. You're coming through just fine. Can you hear us, Angela?
Yeah, we can we can hear you fine, Angela. I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, her connection's a little spotty. Um, let Father Z. How about we we go into your story and we'll get Angela's connection restored and get her back up. Uh, well, um, my uh, my my journey into mass uh, in Latin. You say the Latin mass. Of course, that can mean either the Novus Ordo or the traditional Latin mass. I think we have to make a distinction. You know which we're which we're talking about. Because my first experience of Mass in Latin was in the Novus Ordo. I had been studying classical languages at the University of Minnesota, and I had been a professional musician, and I had been in theater for some while, and I heard that uh, there was a parish in my uh, native Twin Cities in Minnesota that featured fantastic music and uh, and Latin in a beautiful setting. So I, I resolved to go. and. It was uh, at St. Agnes Church in, in St. Paul in Minnesota at the time the great uh, late Monsignor Schuler was the pastor. And he had inherited a, pa a, a parish that had properly implemented uh, what the documents of Vatican II uh, actually said. And so um, Holy Mass there was on Sundays sung uh, in Latin, except for the vernacular readings, which were spoken. And he had an 80-piece orchestra made up of professional musicians from the Minnesota Orchestra and a, and a very large uh, uh, choir. And they performed the masses of Schubert, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, the Viennese school uh, of composers, because it was a, a parish that was founded by um, immigrants from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, the church was built by them in that style. And so it, it created a whole. And um, so I, uh, they also had Gregorian chant and, and Renaissance polyphony and, uh, and all the, the great treasures of, of the Latin, the Latin music, uh, musical tradition of the Roman church. And so um, that was my first experience of, of mass in, in Latin. And I, and I was not Catholic at the time. I was, uh, so I, that, but what has happened there led me to ask the question, who are these people? And, why do they do this uh, every Sunday? And so I, uh, I put my uh, name and number down on a piece of paper and the, gave it to someone on the other side of the communion rail, which they used. And uh, that night I got a call from the pastor and thus began a uh, process of about a year and a half of private instruction all the time. Uh, when he heard that I had been in music and heard my voice, uh, he got me into the choir so I was going to mass on Sundays, and I was still studying classical Latin and Greek at the at the university, and um, so I was hearing, I was hearing the language, you know, being used in a living setting. Um, I became, uh, you know, very involved liturgically, especially as I as I came into the church, uh, was formally received into the church. We were singing Gregorian chant on Sundays at uh, vespers every afternoon on Sunday afternoons. And um, my, uh, then I discovered uh, an old missile, an old hand missile. And I was looking at it and say, wait a minute, this isn't quite the same as what we're doing now. There's some differences here. And that made me start asking some questions and, and, and looking into it and thinking, well, what are, these, what are the changes? What were the changes really about? Especially as, I, as part of my, my entrance into the church, I had read the council documents the the pastor was very clever he kept just shoveling things at me to read to read to read to keep me on the hook it was really very very clever in how he, he reeled me in the sly old fisherman that he was and so um i began uh under understanding that there that the forms were were different um in some ways substantively and uh i as i explored that i wanted to know what is this older form what is this traditional form of the mass and how does that how does that work well it was very difficult to find in a living setting then because we're talking about the 1980s mm. um i came into the church in the early 80s and this was before the the uh the indults that had been granted uh you know, for very limited use of the traditional mass and mm. You, about the only place that you were able to find it were, were in some communities that were uh, either separated from the church or had very ambiguous um, uh, connection or, or canonical identity with the church. But um, eventually, what 
happened is that uh, as I went into seminary and and moved to Rome, uh, I found those who I, I began to work uh, after in about 1989, even as a seminarian, in the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. And that was the commission that was set up after Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre consecrated four bishops without the pontifical mandate. And uh, it was uh, set up to regulate the use of the older form of, of Holy Mass and also the various communities that wanted to use it and preserve those traditions and try to also reconcile the Society of Pius X. And uh, it was in that milieu that I found all sorts of people who knew how to say the older form of Mass. And even as a seminarian, I began to learn it then. And uh, so from the very moment of my, uh, the day of my, my ordination, I had the celebrate to celebrate the older form, and I began to use it uh, immediately. But this is on top of a of many many years of of using Latin, studying Latin, using Latin. Uh, my studies, I went into the, into patristics, the studies of the fathers of the church, and of course that you know kept me steeped in Latin all the time, along with the daily office. So Latin has been a an extremely important part of my daily life going on to almost getting on to close to 40 years now. Uh, that's the cliff note version. Wow. Father, do you exclusively celebrate the uh, extraordinary form of the Mass? Uh, I, I do, and I have now for, for quite a long time. Uh, however, I have always said that, for example, if, if over it, you know, St. Dipsy Dipsy Parish over there in, in, in Black Duck, um, you know, Father Sven O'Brien were to get sick and, and fall over on a Sunday morning and not be able to say Mass. Uh, and I would, and they called me up and say, please, please, please come and say Mass for us. I would go over and I would say the Novus Ordo sure. for them. But um, uh, it's, it's not my, it's not my preference. Um, I do, I do celebrate the Novus Ordo, but uh, my my preferences is for the older form of Mass. Now that I've now that I've discovered it and I've been into it for quite a while. Uh, one other one other little thing uh, about this is that I had been asked by um, the editor of the Wanderer. You know the Wanderer, mm -hmm. the weekly publication, the Wanderer. Um, I had been even before um, the document about liturgical translation came out, Liturgium Authenticum. I had been asked by the editor to write a weekly column about liturgical prayer. So I wrote a column in The Wanderer every week um, looking at what does the prayer really say, the former title of, of my blog, that's where the, the title came from, looking at the Latin, breaking it down, Barney style, and then looking at providing a literal translation and then doing a critical analysis of how the official translation jived with the, the actual Latin. And I did that for many years. I wrote over a million words in The Wanderer during that period that I was doing in the, oh, those wow. columns. So I got to know those prayers very, very well. And uh, as a matter of fact, later on, when the, uh, the preparation of the new translation was taking place, my columns were being used by the Vox Clara committee um, uh, from time to time as they were working on the on the translation of the Congregation for Divine Worship. Got it. I have I have follow-up questions. Uh, uh, you, your story inspired a lot of questions, but uh, we'll get to those in a little bit. Angela, it looks like you are clear and coming through all right. So uh, can we pick up on your story? Yes. How did you find the Latin Mass? <laughs> it so, had to do with Latin being a bad thing and then a good thing. That's kind of where we left off. Yes. So um, I was attracted to it in a uh, Novus Ordo daily mass that I had been attending that utilized a lot of the, the Latin prayers. And I knew about the Latin mass from um, faculty and students on, uh, on campus at the University of Dallas. There was a well-known um, Latin mass parish nearby. So I thought, I would check it out. I think I was sort of expecting just the Novus Ordo, but in Latin. <laughs> um, so I, I went, it was a low mass and I sat in the front row. I distinctly remember, um, which I would not recommend for a first timer. And I, it was a humbling experience. I quickly realized I did not know as much Latin as I thought I did. <laughs> 
I didn't know the mass nearly as well as I thought I did. And I, I felt foolish sitting up there in the front row, uh, not knowing when to sit, stand or kneel. Um, and um, so I wasn't excited to go back like I thought I would be, um, but I, I didn't not like it. So I did, I would attend occasionally throughout the years, um, but I, I still stuck to the Novus Ordo for a while. Um, and I married my husband in the Novus Ordo and he was not Catholic at the time. And a few years later, we moved to a new state and started attending a very reverent Novus Ordo parish that had the occasional Latin mass and we would go to that. Um, but it wasn't until about two years ago um, that things really started to change. A good friend of ours invited us to the baptism of their daughter at a Institute for Christ the King Sovereign Priest Parish, um, which was about 45 minutes away from our house. And we went and um, I'll, I'll never forget the priest, um, just so joyful and the way he welcomed us and his eagerness to explain all the the details of the treasures that were in store there for us. And um, so that combined with seeing a music schedule for the mass um, really roped us in. My husband is actually a music theorist. So I, I think um, his story would relate a lot actually to Father Z's story here. Um, and so my husband saw the schedule and was like, we need to come back. So we started attending somewhat regularly um, and things really started to change, I guess, this past year and a half to make a long, long story short, we had, um, the world sort of falling in around us. It's been a, a crazy time in our lives, um, everything going on just in the news. And we had these amazing Institute priests pointing us to the unchanging amidst all the chaos. And um, the zeal with which they cared for souls, other souls alone was enough, I think, to change hearts. And um, my husband actually was baptized just this past Easter. So praise God for that. Wow. And it's been amazing how our priorities have changed. We've already made career decisions, housing decisions based on um, being near to the Latin mass and, and not actually just the Latin mass, but traditional orders. Um, and I, I will leave it at that for now. <laughs> at first was the Latin, uh, um, at the Latin mass, was that a barrier for you um, at the very first instance? I suppose so. It, it might have been a bit of a pride thing because I was expecting to to know more <laughs> than I did. Um, so it was a it was a barrier that way. Um, just the the humbling experience of it. I'm um, I had studied a bit of Latin. I knew Latin prayers, and so even even then, it was a little off putting. Um, to just to suddenly realize that I was a, in a sense a stranger in my own spiritual home. I'm a cradle Catholic, and here I am. I have no idea what's going on. I should know, and I and I didn't. You were cheated out of your inheritance. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and one one way I think about it is I was uh, waiting for the priest to walk walk me through the mass. You know, kind of like an MC, like turn to me. Uh, in English, tell me what's next and kind of walk me through. But when you go, especially to a low mass, um, he's not turned towards you. And most of it is in silent silence. And of course it's in Latin. Uh, most of it's in Latin besides the Greek. Um, and, uh, that, that can be off putting to me, it was intriguing and I wanted to lean forward and figure out what's going on. And it's so interesting, but to a lot of people, it's a, it's a barrier. So that's very normal. Definitely. Um, we, we joke around, we say, especially in the low mass, you're just, you're chopped liver, <laughs> we say. Um, but I, I, I like that <laughs> about mass now. <laughs> 
So. <laughs> Uh, we'll get the, um, I forgot to mention how to, how to find us on social media. Um, you guys can make comments on this video. We'll get the social media links up, uh, wherever you're watching YouTube or Facebook, uh, we're going to take your questions uh, live. So ask your questions. We'll prioritize, you know, the questions that came in first and the questions that are most relevant, um, wherever you're at, uh, give us those, those questions. Subscribe to us on YouTube and like a good altar server, ring that bell. Um, Instagram is at Mass of the Ages and the Twitter and Facebook is at Liturgy Film. So, Father, I have a question. <laughs> the, um, I like how you brought up the fact that the Latin Mass is actually kind of a, um, um, it's not exactly accurate. Now, I think it's, it's a helpful shorthand because people know the Latin Mass by the Latin Mass or the extraordinary form by that name. But can you talk more about that? Why is, why should the Novus Ordo be also the Latin Mass? Well, first of all, the council fathers said that it should remain, Latin should remain the language of the liturgy. Um, in their document uh, requiring uh, some few mandates that they, they gave for reform of the, of the Roman Rite, they required specifically that Latin remain, the Latin languages to be preserved in the Latin Rite, Sacrosanctum Concilium number 36. And uh, also there's another place in Sacrosanctum Concilium where it says that pastors of souls are required to make sure that their flocks know how to both sing and speak all the parts pertaining to themselves in both the Latin and in the vernacular. So um, the first reason is that that Latin mass should be in Latin, um, even though it isn't um, in most places. It's still the official language of the church. And um, of course, then there are the, the many benefits to having it be in Latin, um, putting good translations in people's hands, uh, whatever translation they want to use. They don't necessarily have to use the same translation. But there are rich, rich undercurrents available in the Latin texts of the prayers that simply don't, that do not easily come across in, in any English translation. There's an old phrase about how traditore traditore, you say in, in, in Italian, uh, that a translator is a traitor because he has to betray some aspects mm. of the original language in order to move it into another language, to, to move the content over in, from one to another. You lose things along the way. You have to make your choices. But in Latin, you don't have to make those choices. And you can have a, you can have a richly commented translation like the ones that I, I prepared for so many years and have done on online for a long time. For example, a lot of people in in looking at the Latin prayer, even if they you know they they know they know a little Latin, if they don't have a little extra background, they might not realize that the prayer that they're looking at in the Latin or hearing in the Latin, this particular prayer has lots of military imagery in it that doesn't come out in the in the English translation. Another prayer has obvious influence of neoplatonic philosophy another one has juridical language another one has agricultural language but those things get lost when mm. it comes over into the english and so those additional that additional subtext that comes out of the latin itself enriches the experience of the prayer as it's heard if you have a little bit of that background that commentary available to you so that's that's another reason i'll just stop with those two there are many others Angela, any, anything you'd like to add? This is just a round table and anytime anyone wants to jump in. Um, I'm sorry, what was the original question? Uh, why, why is the Novus Ordo not celebrated in Latin and should it be, basically? I think that's a little out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting because Father. It well, did let me say, let me pop yeah, back to that. Let me pop back to that. The nuance of the question that that wasn't there before. Why isn't it? Hmm. Um, I think that there was a systematic attempt 
largely successful to slam the doors on the treasury of our rich, deep millennial tradition, um, especially after the, the time of, of the Second Vatican Council. You remember that, that uh, great, you know, very influential theologians uh, such as Karl Rahner uh, said that the, that the Second Vatican Council is, was like the new, a new Council of Jerusalem in other words, like we've turned the clock back to zero and we're starting mm. again now and everything that went before, well, you know, but now we have something brand new. Uh, Hans Kung said that, uh, you know, the, that the council didn't go nearly far enough. Um, there are some uh, uh, wonks today that are, that are talking about uh, Vatican II being the normative lens through which the entire tradition has to be read. And in other words, to reinterpret things, there was there if if they were if the people who wanted to make these huge changes in the church were going to be successful, they had to slam the door of that tradition and start cutting people off from it. And I think it was the elimination of Latin out of the schools, the elimination of Latin out of our daily liturgical worship, that began to to cause a a, a rupture in our Catholic identity that we're still dealing with today. Um, because we are our rights. If you change our rights, you change our identity. You know, it's the old uh, adage, lex orandi, lex credendi, right? That if you, that, that the way that we pray has a reciprocal relationship with what we believe. If you change the way we pray, you begin to change the people's belief. At the same time, the people's belief then has a reciprocal relationship and starts begins to change the prayer and it's a slow, it's a long process that that happens but you know we're a lot of years into it now and we're starting to see how that is working out so i think there was a systematic and and uh and planned and coordinated uh attempt to change the church in a radical way and that had to be that the thing that had to go was Latin. Yeah, people need to understand that it wasn't just um, Vatican II happened and the new mass rolled off the shelf. There was this period of time where the council documents were interpreted and reinterpreted and uh, hashed apart, and um, certain things were overlooked. Like, for example, Father, you said that you know said that, yeah, the vernacular may be introduced to some parts of the Mass. That's a very restrictive um, statement, but Latin must be preserved. That's and let's preserved. remember that this grew out of a, of a decades of, of what we call the liturgical movement, and which had different, different branches. Um, there were those who were more looking for more innovation. There were those who were seeking deeper understanding. You know, there were, without making radical changes, but to, to bring the riches to the people without making huge changes. Others well, wanted big changes. But so this, there was a lot going on in the 20th century uh, liturgically. And, and those various, those various uh, f force vectors had their influence on the shaping of how the council document was interpreted. And of course, there was a very influential group that, that, shall we say, took care, took control of divulging the council documents as they were coming out along with commentary. And if you can control the commentary, you can make a huge impact on how it's going to be initially implemented. And uh, um, I, I would refer anybody who's interested in that to the uh, the journal, long time journal of sacred music called Sacred Music, uh, back in the day when uh, the Monsignor Schuler that I mentioned was the editor of that, and he put together a series of longish articles about the implementation of the documents on liturgy uh, that came out of the of the council and talked about how the various forces used their influence to guide the interpretation of those uh, of those things such that we wound up with the 
abandoning of music and uh, uh, of our musical tradition, which is so important to the conversion of so many converts, mm -hmm. even as we you know heard today, Latin and and uh, everything having to do with architecture and the orientation of the altar and everything that there is. So that's in sacred music. Uh, um, uh, you look for for Monsignor Schuler's articles on the in, the uh, implementation of the the council documents. Yeah, what people need to realize is that um, when you replace Latin with English, um, you're in one fell swoop. Uh, you need to replace centuries and centuries of sacred music. And how are we supposed to replace that? The, in that's a right. You know, suddenly, the guitar, which never in the history of the church had been a liturgical instrument, is about the only thing we've got because they're supposed to have a certain kind of a music, you know, that's that's you know this way or that way. For example, um, uh, Joseph Ratzinger writing about the the origin of music. He talks about uh, he would he would talk about a music that came. Uh, how did he put it? He uh, a music für das Volk and a music von dem Volk. And uh, there is a music that that would come organically out of a people, like the the like rich folk music and things like that. And then there is music für das Volk, which was just like entertainment kind of music. And there be mm. these categories became confused at a certain point when the treasury of music was slammed shut. And therefore, there was no vernacular music. And so all sorts of people who were not well prepared um, started having to churn stuff out uh, suddenly using the bare, bare resources that they had. And let's just say that results varied. Hmm. We'll leave it at that. The, the council, um, one of the guiding principles after the council was that the participation of the faithful is the indispensable font it's what it's what we should we should strive to do more than anything else so all the reforms to the mass should have that as its kind of central purpose um so well the in, i mean we need to make distinctions here participation of the people well <laughs> that could mean a lot of things you know <laughs> Uh, what the what the, the the consul document what the fathers wanted was full conscious and active participation, and this is something that had been talked about in papal documents even during the liturgical movement for many decades before the Second Vatican Council came along. So that what you what you hear in Vatican II is the fruit of reflection uh, that had been going on for some time, and you know everybody, I think, is going to agree. That we should have full, conscious, and active participation in in our sacred liturgical worship. You know what? What are the alternatives? Partial, distracted, <laughs> uh, and uh, what? What would you say? Partial, distractive, and passive. You know, participate in inert. I think that's even a better word. Inert participation. You know, how does how is that even participation? Right. So in a way, that participation is just spun out with these three additional terms to help us make distinctions because we distinguish bene docet, right? Who makes distinctions, teaches well. And so we have a, we have a, a, a goal of, of trying to, to have people participate well. Now, it, there was a document before the council on sacred music. Uh, it was still um, in the time, it was very at the very end of the reign of Pius XII, if I remember correctly. And there was an important phrase in that, that the fullest sense of participation was the reception of Holy Communion in the state of grace. Now, if, now that should be the ideal, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could have a little old blind woman who has a walker who can barely hear what's going on. And you can have a, a young guy over there who is perfectly able to carry a bowl around or something and, and sing every word of the vernacular hymn that they have. <laughs> and while he's doing that, 
he's thinking about you know the ball game that's on right now i wish i had or wish i knew what the score was and his mind is a million miles away anybody everybody has had the experience of of reading for a while and suddenly you realize you've been turning you've been reading the words and turning the, the pages but your mind was actually somewhere else you know and you look back wow you know i read that but i did i really read it or you catch yourself humming and someone says would you please stop whistling that tune or humming or whatever you didn't even know you were doing it singing and thinking about the groceries that you have to pick up you're singing all the words outwardly no one would know that you're not you know engaged but your mind is really over there because you know you have to stop at 7-eleven on the way home you know so there are all different levels of of full conscious and active participation so i would submit that the little old woman who can't who barely hear anything can't see anything that's going on can't get up and carry a bowl is probably participating more fully consciously and actively than a whole lot of people out there who are singing every word of every hymn and carrying a ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. So this That's idea right. of full, conscious and active, full conscious and active participation has been terribly um, uh, abused over the years as an excuse to, to make people do active things or you know, a terrible kind of form of clericalization of the laity. The word, you know, people talk, oh, clericalism, it's so terrible. But, you know, the word, you know, the worst kind of clericalism is the condescending attitude that I, as a priest, am going to allow you to do something that I do. Mm. Because otherwise, if you don't, you're not truly participating. Well, that's, mm. that's a lie. You know, our participation stems from our baptismal character. You know, the ability, you know, the the the, the share in the the the, ba the the baptismal that the baptized have in the priesthood of Christ to offer spiritual sacrifices pleasing to the Lord, so that when they respond at mass, it's Christ's words. Christ is using their voice. You know, that's that kind of thing is an amazing, profound kind of participation, and um, in Latin or in the vernacular. But uh, we're getting a little, you know, a, a feel. But I, but, but that point about participation is extremely important. Oh, that's that's totally right. And they seem to, um, you know, have their own interpretation of what active means. Um, to to modern man, active sounds like an activity. It sounds like you have to be doing something externally. Um, but obviously, it's it's more about just a a real participation not not a fake or a false or a partial one um yeah there's an act there's a way to be actively receptive right you know one of the thing the hardest things to do is to listen carefully and attentively which is why we say prayers for example before we have readings in mass <laughs> you know the, the help me you know help me to understand things um, help me to help me to you know say this properly. The, the, we, 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 and it takes a lot of work. It's hard to listen in an active way. Now you're passive in the sense that you're listening and not doing the talking, but that's not passivity. I mean, mm -hmm. if you are actively, it's like imagine that you're reaching out with the fingers of your ears and your mind and your heart to grab every word that's coming and bring it in so that you, so that it can it touch you and affect you because Christ is present in the reading of scripture that's the kind of thing i'm talking about that's not passive it it is but it isn't at all it's very active and it's hard it's hard it's work see this is this is part of the problem in in re, in rendering uh as, certain aspects into the vernacular into the way that people talk in a daily way, as opposed to a highly stylized English, you know, or, you know, the vernacular, ver Verna, the Verna was a household slave. So vernacular really refers to the way that household slaves used to talk in the streets of ancient Rome. It was not at all like the, the liturgical prayer that they had in ancient La in the ancient church. The Latin of the ancient Latin prayers are highly stylized. This is not a vernacular. 
the at all. There's a big gulf between the way that people talked in the streets and the way that they would they would they would hear their prayers and their worship. Uh, that's all a canard, you know. That well, the the Latin was the vernacular at the time. Therefore, we have to have English today because English is the vernacular. No, 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 no. That's uh, that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't hide at all. But we have um, the uh, the the style of the the style of the language, um, the 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 difficulties of of our senses. For example, every rite, every rite, a liturgical rite of the church. Um, denies you the use or the access of some of your senses in the east they have the iconostasis um we we use veils and so forth to cover things over you know you can't unveil you can't unveil a beautiful mystery unless it's veiled first right in order to unveil something you have to veil it first and so that the church of wisdom also veils certain things and in the latin church in the west instead of having physical barriers and there were physical barriers in the early in in early roman worship they would draw curtains and so forth but uh the latin functions as a veil so that you can have a you can have a, a a a beautiful unveiling of the of the content. It gives you an opportunity to prayer to 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 pray in an apophatic way, in a way that certain aspects of your experience are denied, so that in the in 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 what you you begin to experience the transcendent through the hard aspects of liturgy, the silence instead of having a you know, constantly filled with noise mm -hmm. through a language that you don't immediately apprehend as if it's your daily language, through difficult gestures, through veiling things. All of these things contribute to bring a person into an encounter with mystery, the kind of mystery that can transform you, just as Moses would go into the tent of meeting. And when he came out, his face was so bright from his encounter with God that he had to wear a veil over his face. This is the kind of thing that we're looking for in our sacred worship. Yeah. We're looking for something in our sacred worship that, that digs down into the very most profound questions and things that you have to deal with in your life. For example, where am I going to go when I die? In a way, the liturgy, every aspect of say every sacred liturgical moment that we have in the church has to be a preparation for death. And if it isn't, if it's just happy, happy puppies mm. and, and daisies and aren't you all wonderful, good morning, you know, that kind of stuff, is our sacred liturgical worship really doing what it's supposed to do? You know, our participation in it is serious and it's hard. What is, what is easy about bringing the divine into contact with our, our human experience? <laughs> There's absolutely nothing easy about that. So why should the language be easy? Why should any of this stuff be easy? Like you know, you know, goo goo gaga. That you know, why why should it why should it be always reduced to the lowest common denominator? You know that that's absolutely contrary to the very reason why we walk into a church in the first place. Right. Yeah. Some somewhere along the line, I think we got this idea that we shouldn't have to work to prepare for mass, right? It's this quick catechesis. Um, you come in for an hour on Sunday and you go back to your Sunday chores. You got to mow the lawn or grocery shop. Um, and in that hour, you're somehow, you're just supposed to get everything that you need for the week and you're supposed to understand it quickly um, because heaven forbid you, you prepare ahead of time by reading the readings or, um, learning what's actually going up going on up there and in, in the sanctuary it's just um yeah, interesting you, that you, as we make the mass something. more accessible we we access less of it <laughs> yeah that that's ex that, that's right in a way i sometimes i use the analogy of 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 base watching baseball you know, there's a different. You go to the ball game, you go to the park. It's a, a certain experience, and then you got the TV experience of baseball, right? Where you can see all the mechanics of the game, right down to slowing the ball down so that you can actually see the rotation of the stitches on the ball. Well, that's interesting. You know, it's fascinating in a way, but it 
it's not the same experience as being in the ballpark. Wow, and if we, great. and it, you know, once you, once you get, once you get all of that unveiled and there's no mystery left, well, then what is it that you're actually gaining? Of course, you're, you know, there's, there's the, the, you know, there's of course, Holy communion, but a lot of this, this speaks to the point of a lot of times mass is reduced really to just a kind of a communion service that has readings and so forth. No, from beginning to end, the entire thing is a sacred action. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we make it so easy, so accessible, you know, you're, you're a, you're a, 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 a mother of, of children. You have children. And, mm -hmm. uh, yes, too. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a, 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 a criticism of Latin and say, well, my children don't understand the Latin. Well, number one, they probably don't understand the English either. You know, if you stop to think about it, you ask, ask people as they're on, on their way out of mass on Sunday, what was the second reading? Uh, <laughs> they, they probably can't tell you because they weren't engaged. And even if they can tell you, okay, now can you please explain what St. Paul meant? Well, probably not. I mean, this stuff is hard, mm -hmm. but if, if, if you talked about preparing to go to mass mm -hmm. and preparing, you know, by looking at the re I really like that point. And I talk about this all the time, even to congregations start on Thursday to look at the readings for Sunday on Sunday afternoon, review what you heard. And on Monday and Tuesday, maybe give yourself a rest on Wednesday and then Thursday, then start again. If your children, you know, you want to make sure that your children um, understand, you know, the readings and understand what they're hearing. Well, well, mom and dad, you are the primary educators of your children, not father, not mm -hmm. the church. You are. So get off your chair and start teaching your children sit down with them and start preparing with them for mass. You're the educator. If it, if the children aren't understanding what's being heard at mass, it's your fault. See? Sure. And it takes, it takes work. Um, there's a great book by Maria Montessori um, titled the, the mass explained to children. And this is Maria Montessori from the, the Montessori method. Mm -hmm. She knows children well. And one of the striking points she makes in there um, is that, Mass is not the time for catechesis. It's not the time to be. It's not a didactic what, moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not the time to be explaining what's going on. Um, this should be done outside the mass, and and she does this not to be um, cruel or overly strict. Her point is that this actually better facilitates the the natural aptitude that children have towards beauty and mystery. If you let if you just let them soak in the mass while they're there and teach them outside, um, we we love what we know. So if you if you just throw them in mass and expect them to get everything right there, um, it's it's not leading them there in the, in the way that. They That's are. a good point. What you made too. We love what we know, mm -hmm. and it's isn't it true that that when you love something or someone, you want to know more and more and more exactly. about him or her or it. That, that, and, the, and, and the more you know, the more you tend to be attracted to it. And, in, in the, and really, when we get right down to it, the content of the readings and the content of the prayers isn't just formulae to learn or things that we can break down and drill into in the catechesis. The true content of the prayer is a person. It's, it's Christ. And so as we, as we, we, we get to know those things more and more and more and all the deep undercurrents that it has, which is even easier to get into because you're using Latin than the vernacular, then you are having a, a, a more of a personal, you can have a personal contact with the, the person who is actually speaking them to you. Yes, and even as an adult, I've noticed uh, this since attending the Latin Mass, I suddenly know all these things I never knew about the Novo Sordo and I've, I was born and raised Catholic and I had no idea that uh, things were done a certain way um, and why. And it's, 
just from attending the Latin mass and wanting to know more, um, I can't get enough of it. It's just, it's a joy. What is it like having two kids at the Latin mass with the Latin, specifically with the Latin language? Do you, do you see it as a barrier? I think some people listening to this might think we're being a little too, um, like we're overlooking things that are actual really big obstacles for some people. So was it an obstacle for you or, at all? Sure, definitely. So I think that this actually touches on what we were just saying a few moments ago about the different ideas of participation. Um, I, I approached the Latin mass like I, I needed to hug that red missalette and just, hmm. you know, follow along. And um, it was very hard to do because of the Latin. I I didn't know where <laughs> where we were and I just got to points where I couldn't believe that the priest was saying all those words, right? It's just, how is he on this page? I'm still over here soaking in the words. I don't know what's going on. Um, and then you add a toddler on your lap and <laughs> just like, <laughs> for, forget about it. I can't hold this for more than two seconds. Um, That's right. And yeah, so the real the real change for me happened um, when I, I kind of I gave my, first of all, I gave myself permission to set the red, the red was let down and approach mass more like a holy hour, especially in those, those beginning months. Um, but the second thing and the thing that takes more work and that maybe people don't want to hear is I, we read the readings before mass. Um, we read about the Latin mass um, on the way to church. We, have a bit of a drive. So we read it out loud as a family and uh, there are great books for that. Um, uh, the Maria Montessori book being one of them, especially if you have a lot of children in the car, um, she, she explains it beautifully. And um, knowing more about the mass outside of mass made it easier to recognize where we were while I was there and be able to reorient uh, my thoughts and my prayers to be present in the mass. Um, yeah, I would add to that and say that, um, uh, you know, going to Nova Sordo, and I'm particularly talking about Nova Sordo where everything is out loud and everything is in English, um, your kids are not understanding <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> they're, they're distracted, just like you are. It's actually hard to be attentive to something that's, um, you know, out loud, constant. Uh, it's like it, it can feel like a lecture for an hour where everything's out loud in the vernacular. And I, I think there's something to be said for um, the understanding that is that you both have been talking about that is a little deeper than just an, an immediate awareness of the words that are being said. And that is when my kids are at mass, I'm father of four, um, four going on nine. Um, <laughs> and uh, when, when we're at mass, they might not understand the words being said, but at least they understand that something really important is happening. Yes. They get yes. it. Yeah. They're like, oh, I, I, I'm just looking around waiting for the world to end because something very, you know, world changing is happening. Up on There's the like altar. newcomers to mass too, who have never been to it, non-Catholics or uh, uh, they, they'll walk in and go, uh, this is not the usual kind of daily thing that I see every day. Right. It's taken out of the ordinary, the ordinary every day. Um, I think the seriousness of it is made more apparent by the silence, by the language that the children can't understand. Um, um, yeah, it's just. I think we shouldn't um, sell them short. I guess I think that they are capable of soaking in more mystery and beauty than we realize. This is something I've wondered about every once in a while. I've had this, I've had the strong sense that children are innately liturgical. Hmm. Um, they like ritual. Yes. Um, they like routine. Boy, do they like doing the same thing. Over <laughs> they like the same thing over and over, you know. <laughs> And, and to the point of driving parents nuts, I think, you know, yes. at times. And um, they love order to it. Like you order in a different order. Just mm -hmm. have, yeah. <laughs> I think they're innately liturgical. 
That's mm -hmm. uh, that's how I, I describe it. And so many parents of young children have have told me that their 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 children behave one way when they're at the Novus Ordo and another way when they're at the traditional Latin Mass. And um, yeah. because it just fascinates them in a kind of a different way. Uh, there's something special or different going on that they don't hear all the time. And it, it keeps their attention a little bit more. And um, also probably they, they, they pick up on the on the, the stillness and the focus of the people around them maybe a little bit more. And, um, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a parent of young, young children, but uh, I also notice this too um, from my vantage point as a priest, uh, you know, watching children, you know, when I turn around, if, if I happen to look up, usually you're supposed to keep your eyes down, but, you know, if you do look up every once in a while, you can see these little faces, you know, just riveted, I mean, absolutely riveted on, on what's going on. And um, I think children are liturg little liturgical beings. It's very natural to them. And they respond well. The more liturgical a thing is, I think the more they respond to it. Yes, definitely. I would agree with that. I think that there's something about the natural rhythm of the mass um, that I just see in my three-year-old's bones in a way that I don't think adults can even access, right? Just the the standing up and the sitting down of the, the, the ritual of the postures and the language, the rhythms of the speech patterns. We're not as adults primed for that in the same way that children are, right? They're still getting their language acquisition and all these things. Um, and I know another, another aspect if I can just jump in is I, I firmly believe on the testimony of many uh, uh, friends who have, have children, uh, I strongly suspect that young children can see their angels. <laughs> so who knows what they're seeing up there too, you know, besides what uh, what they're hearing and, you know, seeing in the earthly sense. But Sure. Yeah. We to throw that, that in. Is that <laughs> Uh, just to put a capstone on this idea of um, understanding and different levels of understanding, there's a fascinating speech that Pope Paul VI gave on the introduction of English as the principal, or the vernacular, as the principal language of the liturgy. And uh, what people need to understand is it's not like uh, the church, you know, in a generation just decided Latin wasn't important. It's actually always held that Latin is of critical importance. John the 23rd, who called the council eight months before the council started, he said exactly why we want to preserve Latin. He gave, I know Father Z would know a lot about this, but you know, it, it needs to be universal, immutable, and etc. And we, we can get into that. But I just want to read this speech Paul the sixth gave lamenting the loss of Latin and hear how it kind of goes, he goes about it. It's, it's, it's amazing that he said this. Um, so on the implementation of the new mass, no longer Latin, but the spoken language language will be the principal language of the mass. The introduction of the vernacular will, will certainly be a great sacrifice for those who know the beauty, the power and the expressive sacrality of Latin. We are parting with the speech of the Christian centuries. We're becoming like profane intruders in the literary preserve of sacred utterance. We will lose a great part of that stupendous and incomparable artistic and spiritual thing, the Gre Gregorian chant. We have reason indeed for regret, almost for bewilderment. What can we put in the place of that language of the angels? We are giving up something of priceless worth, but why? What is more precious than these loftiest of our church's values? The answer will seem banal, prosaic, yet it is a good answer because it is human, because it is apostolic. Understanding of prayer is worth more than the silken garments in which it is royally dressed. 
<laughs> Father's Eve. <laughs> mm. You have something you want to say. Well, I have a lot to say about that. I have said a lot about that. As a matter of fact, back in 2009, leading up to the 40th anniversary of the implementation of the Novus Ordo, I made three podcasts uh, about Paul VI's general audience speeches, which you quoted, on the eve of the implementation of the Novus Ordo, back in that advent of 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 uh, of um, was it 69? 70, uh, uh, 69, uh, 69 and 70. It's, um, and I contextualized it too. I talk about what was going on in the 60s. What was going on back then when all this, you know, all these changes and so forth were made? I, if people go to the go to the blog, fatherzonline.com, and up at the top there's a bar, you know, at the near the header where there's you'll see podcasts. And go down to my my list of podcasts from 2009. I have three of them. Each one of them starts 40 years ago, Paul VI on the eve of the Novus Ordo. And I quote extensively from those things and comment on them. I read the whole addresses and, and comment on them. And uh, that whole business about, you know, the silken whatever in, in which it's, you know, well, you know, beauty is a, is a transcendental. <laughs> yeah. Beauty leads to truth. And... Um, uh, which which can lead people to God, and I, I, you can tell Paul the Sixth was in agony when he, yeah, he 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 said that, and I, That's right. it's it's difficult for me in a way to grasp that he believed what he was saying, uh, knowing Paul the Sixth. I, I just it's hard to understand uh, that he really believed it, but he. Uh, I suppose he was, he felt like, you know, Alia Yakta, right? The die is cast, and now we have to find a way to rationalize this. And because it's certainly what he was talking about is not what the council fathers mandated. Yep. You know, it's something right. different. Something happened between 1969 and the end of the council. And, um, and, uh, I would, I refer, um, the, uh, those who are watching and listening back to those. All extremely important articles where Monsignor Schuler documented what happened with the implementation of the of the liturgical and musical uh, documents um, in in sacred music, the, the journal Sacred Music. They are all online. I think um, I'm trying to remember. Is it maybe Corpus Christi Watershed that has all of those things online? I think probably they're doing great work. Mm -hmm. That's also the time period we're covering in Mass of the Ages is that critical time period of 62 to 69. Um, I think in, in just seven years, you can see how drastic the change was from a, a council document that received, you know, 11, 1100 yes votes and only like 40 against votes, something like that with the bishops. Because it, you, it, it said, you know, yeah, okay, we see a benefit to the vernacular, but Latin must be preserved, especially in the ordinary of the Mass, the unchanging parts of the Mass, obviously the canon, the Eucharistic prayer. No one even mentioned that we should touch. It was untouchable. Um, that the well, it, it said, the, the, the Council Father said that no change should be made unless it's truly for the good of the Catholic faithful. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm puzzled to think, you know, why some of the changes that they made are truly for the good of the Catholic faithful. Um, right. How about uh, that everything that's done should be an organic development of what has always gone before? Well, there were break after break after break, rupture after rupture after rupture with what happened before. So, you know, the the there was a kind of a wholesale, um, you know, it was... I don't know. I the 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 image the image of, of people busting through the doors on Black Friday, you know, uh, uh, and going in and ravaging around in the stores uh, uh, came to mind. You know what happened afterwards because there was this experimentation and all this kind of stuff that was going on. But and you know there are various characters involved in this that had their own agendas, and uh, who wanted to decentralize the. The, the you know the, the the authority of Rome to guide both 
liturgy and therefore doctrine. They understood, they understood clearly that the changes that were being made would affect doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a book that was put out by the former um, master of ceremonies to uh, John Paul II, Piero Marini, um, called a challenging, I think the book title is A Challenging Reform. And Marini was the secretary to a guy who was on the inside of the concilium that was set up to implement the liturgical changes mandated by the Council Fathers. And Marini recounts the inner workings of the concilium and what they were trying to do. And at one point, there's this one, there's a poignant moment in which when they, the concilium received its mandate from Paul VI, they realized that they were about to engage in the greatest reform in the church because the liturgical reform would also affect doctrine. He comes right out and he says it. And so that's what they were, that's what they were up to. That's right. It's, uh, oh. Go ahead, Angela. It's just interesting to note how um, the change in language doesn't necessarily even do what they wanted it, or the the ostensible reason for doing it was to get more approachable right in the vernacular. Uh, didn't even do what they wanted it to do. I'm just thinking, especially at the mention of chant, just as like having young children, there's no better way than for me to instill the prayers of the church in their hearts than by introducing them to chant. Um, and it's it's uh, just not my experience, right, that taking this away would make it more accessible. Um, it's actually, it's a beautiful way to teach your children the prayers of the church. And a lot is lost, I think. The, uh, I just pulled up the, the reference to that book, that A Challenging Reform. Uh, the thing that I quoted is on page 46. This is, these are, this is, these are Marini's words. And he was the secretary, he was the, the collaborator with uh, Anibali Bunini in the, in the concilium. He said, they met in public to begin one of the greatest liturgical reforms in the history of the Western church. Unlike the reform after Trent, it was all the greater because it also dealt with doctrine. See, the liturgical reform after Trent was to reflect the doctrine of Trent. <laughs> That's right. right. And everything that went before. Now, uh, earlier in, in, our, in our interview today, I mentioned that there are those who say that Vatican II is supposed to be the normative rereading for everything that went before. But that constitutes a, a, a rupture uh, in a way, because you can, you, can, <laughs> you can effectively make it say whatever you want. It's mm -hmm. part of the problem. That's right. I'll just rapid fire some of these reasons why um, the church has held Latin as you know, the, the principal language of, of you know, church documents and the liturgy. This is from Pope John the 23rd, and again, eight months before Vatican II. This is, we, we just heard from the, the Pope who, who finished the council, and this is the Pope who began the council. So he says, um, the Latin, uh, we have the Latin because it's a language which is universal, immutable, which means unchanging, and non-vernacular. And I think these reasons get more and more solid for why we would want a liturgy in Latin. So firstly, universal. So the instrument of communication across the globe is uniform and universal. It unites us as Catholics, not just his globally, but historically it connects us to the church and then unchanging or immutable modern. This is what he says. Modern languages are liable to change and no single one of them is superior, superior to the others in authority. Whereas Latin is set and unchanging. It has long since ceased to be affected by those alterations in the meaning of words, which are the normal result of daily popular use. And finally, non vernacular. The Catholic Church has a dignity far surpassing that of every of merely human society. 
for it was founded by Christ the Lord. It is altogether fitting, therefore, that the language it uses should be noble, majestic, and non-vernacular. It's a treasure of incomparable worth, he says a little bit later. So, and a, a, a helpful thing for me to think about was like, everything in the liturgy is set apart for a sacred purpose. It's what the priest wears, you know, uh, what the priest uses. Um, and why would we not have the language that's spoken be set apart for, for something sacred? And like you were talking about, Father Z, earlier, something mysterious, something that kind of hides the mystery so we lean into it and try to uncover it. I think that's... Why so, should we have a, a sacred language? You mean like other religions do? No, it, it wasn't a question. I was just... <laughs> no, I was making a oh, I see. <laughs> rhetorical question. Yeah. I've, That's right. I've actually seen the um, the Latin language referred to as being consecrated by the cross, um, by its inclusion on the cross. This was... Um, <laughs> I'm getting a face from Father Z here. Um, <laughs> This was uh, <laughs> the Holy Mass explained by Don't look uh, at him. Nicholas Just keep Deere. <laughs> um, but whether or not that the use of that particular word is that is correct, um, I it's a it's an amazing thing to think about, right? That Holy Mother Church has thought of everything, including the the words on our lips for for so holy a, a purpose. Okay, I'm I'm gonna uh, let me jump in on since you. Since you mentioned my reaction, I'll just jump in for a second. Um, so the, the argument being that because Latin was included on the titulus of the, of the cross, along with Greek and um, mm -hmm. Hebrew, uh, therefore it's a sacred language. Um, okay, well... I, I'm going. I'm going to. Uh, I'll stipulate that things don't happen by accident. Um, I'm not sure that the sacrality of Latin comes from the fact that Pontius Pilate ordered it written on the mm. on the the titulus. However, um, Latin showing up there doesn't mean nothing. And in fact, uh, Latin. Uh, you know, Peter going to Rome. You know, where Latin is used doesn't mean nothing. And the fact that the Roman Empire uh, was um, bound together by Latin doesn't mean nothing. And the fact that we've been praying in Latin for a really long time means a whole lot. Um, Joseph Ratzinger, in, in his book, Spiritual, uh, Spirit of the Liturgy, talks about how, and it has to do with the pro multis controversy, talks about liturgical prayer as being its own theological locus. Um, it's a starting point for, for theology that can't be set aside. You know, so say, for example, we have the scriptural accounts here. We have the reference back to Isaiah uh, involved in it and all this business going on. But the very fact that we've been saying pro multis for all this time is its own theological starting point that cannot simply be set aside. The fact that we've been praying in the Latin language for as long as we have been, in itself, carries weight that cannot easily be set aside. As a matter of fact, there's no, in a way, what we are doing here is absurd on the face of it. Trying to argue that Latin has to be argued for. Mm -hmm. If anything, the vernacular, the, the, the entire weight of proof, the burden of proof is on anybody who should, who are saying that we should be praying liturgically in a language other than Latin. You know, what are the fruits mm -hmm. that we've seen so far? The fruits of praying in Latin led to the magnificent uh, uh, age of missionaries and the, the you know building of everything that we have, the, the infrastructure of the church that we have, the, the magnificent lives of the saints whom we venerate, they were all worth, nourished in that, in that liturgical uh, milieu. Well, we haven't seen the fruits, the entire, you know, the, the long-term fruits, uh, you know, the church thinking in centuries of praying in, in 
uh, people's uh, uh, you know native tongues. But so far, the track record doesn't seem to be all that good. You know, perhaps the fruit will be that the Latin comes back with more vigor. Possible, yeah. Um, one of the thing, you know, it's like Joni Mitchell's song. You know, you don't it don't seem to always go. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. <laughs> you know, they paved paradise, put up a parking lot. Well, you know, in a way. That's kind of what uh, has happened. Um, we begin to value the things that we lo have lost. And as the demographic sinkhole that's opening up at the church continues to gobble up more and more Catholics who will never be seen in, in churches again, um, unless something truly remarkable happens, um, smaller and smaller groups with a strong Catholic identity are going to find each other. And I think that the liturgical experience the foundation of their integration with each other with all of their various gifts is going to be the traditional liturgy in latin i'm convinced of it i'm absolutely convinced of it so let's fast forward um 500 years do you think there would be a point in time where the the latin mass or the extraordinary form uh will incorporate some vernacular that it already doesn't have. Do you think that would be beneficial? And that's a secondary question, Father. So. Is that uh, that's directed to me? Um, yes. Well, look, uh, look at it. The, look, Benedict the Sixteenth wanted to do something that he had been thinking about for a long time. He he understood correctly, and he wrote about this that the implementation of an artificially cobbled together cobbled together it sounds terribly you know it sounds awful but an artificially composed um liturgical rite on the church constituted a rupture and it broke the organic development you know slow and organic development of our liturgical worship that's always been going on you know but very, very slowly and his idea was that if we were to have the older the, the traditional older form of mass together with the Novus Ordo side by side that there would be a mutual enrichment I call it a gravitational pull hmm. the one on the other I think when I first was able to talk to him about this in my years in Rome I think he had the idea that the the the, the logical priority would be given to the Novus Ordo since it was the you know the one that was being celebrated everywhere and it came out of the, the council, even though it came out of the council kind of sideways. As he as years went on, though, I had the sense that he thought, no, it's gonna be it's gotta be the other way around. The traditional mass has to be the the critical mass in this in the gravitational sense, and the logic or priority would go to this rather than that. And and the gravitational pull and the mutual enrichment coming into the older form of mass would be slow and organic once they were once they were side by side and stable together. I think we need a period of stability, a long period of stability of having the traditional mass, traditional Latin mass in many more places uh, before any kind of changes or tinkering with it is even considered. Some people want to jump in and start kind of tinkering with it right now. I think that's a mistake. I think I think it needs to have a period of stability. We have to learn who we are with that right, because we are our rights. We have to learn who we are again through a stable use of that for a while. Side by side with the Novus Ordo, fine, you know, and then to a certain extent, because we're human beings, market forces are going to play in this too. People will vote with their feet. You know, or with their automobiles, as a case, as you know, they find destination parishes or, or whatever that that disturbs some people and are the only hope of others. Um, vernacular um, in in the older form of mass. That's what the council fathers, I think, envisioned. You know, they wanted. I think they were thinking about the readings, having the readings in the vernacular. That's it. It's interesting that that's what the. That's what, uh, in many places, the priests of the Society of St. Pius X do. They have readings in the vernacular. Um, 
uh, sometimes uh, read by the priest at the altar in low mass, not in not in sung mass or solemn masses. Uh, sometimes while a priest is reading uh, the, the the reading in Latin at the altar, uh, it's being read by by someone at the at the ambo. Um, is that a good solution? I don't know. I, I I'm not sure because I I I have the view that every single word of holy mass is a sacrificial offering. It's not we're not stepping out to have a lesson in scripture now. It's every word including the scripture readings are a sacrificial offering that are being raised to God. So it's appropriate that they should be in the sacral language, you know. If then they're reread afterwards, that's fine. But I, I just I just hesitate about that. I, I understand that there's some value in doing it that way. I understand what the council fathers are driving at uh, in their great pastoral solicitude and the love of their people. You know, they thought that this could be a good thing. That's why the the mandate itself is that the that the Latin should be preserved in some vernacular in certain occasions can be used instead of a wholesale rush to do everything in the vernacular. This overly optimistic rush to in a, in a kind of a pastoral solicitude that um yeah it was it was a it was a time of of great optimism about man we were very coming out of a terrible period in human history you know the the 40s and yeah, it just it seems to me that just they just got way out over their skis, and we're kind of paying for it now. I think a lot of a lot of good is done, and you know Pope Paul the uh, desire for uh, his flock to understand the prayers. A lot of that is done when, like you said, Father, you know we we read the readings in English in addition to doing them in Latin, and also the the introduction of hand missiles which was a, a fruit, you know, from the very beginning of the liturgical movement. Let's, let's unpack the liturgy for people, not change the liturgy, but let's unpack the liturgy, let people learn what's happening. And um, that seems to solve a lot of the problems. I mean, people can have different trans, different people can have different translations side by side in different languages. But they can also within English, they can have this edition, that edition, this edition, and each one of them has could have its own profound notes, yeah. you know, talking about, hey, this is something that you might not know, but this particular word here is, you know, military imagery and it reminds us that we are members of the church militant and that kind of thing, that there are enemies, you know, the world of flesh and the devil. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways in which those things can be unpacked to the word that you use. Yeah. There, we've answered a lot of the questions just in the course of our conversation, but one person asked, and this is this is related and pretty incisive, I think. She, uh, he or she said, "Should I follow the missal in English because I understand it, or Latin because it is sacred?" So, someone with a hand missal is it like, "Oh, Latin is a better language. I should read the Latin or the English because it helps me enter into the mass more." Well, I, I don't think we, you know, look, we're Catholic. We don't have to make a decision between one or the other. <laughs> look at them both. <laughs> Don't look at either. Listen, you know, take it in. Uh, review before you go to mass, so that you don't have to be stuck to the page. Um, review it afterwards. Um, take a look at it again during the week. I don't. I don't think that you have to. We're we're not either or people here. We're we're both and. Uh, the Latin has pride of place. Uh, because it's the official language of the church, and if you were at the traditional Latin mass, it makes sense that you should actually be listening to the Latin. Um, but uh, you know, do it one way one week, another way another week. You know, you don't have to. You know, let let's let's try to let's try to avoid uh, uh, uniformity and rigidity hmm. that the Novus Ordo, by the way, tends to impose. Mm -hmm we can be a little free with this. If you want to kneel, you can kneel. You want to yeah. stand. If you want to get up and go to Holy Communion instead of row by row, which I detest because I think it 
puts a, a psychological pressure on people to go to communion who know they shouldn't be going up there. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's just kind of, you know, my, my years in, you know, I'm, I'm Prussian, you know, I like orderly things, but, but all those years in Rome, you know, taught me a little bit more about what it is to be a Roman Catholic. Just sometimes got to roll with it, you know, relax. And it doesn't have to be rigid and there's not a specific way that you have to do it every single time. If you want to pray your rosary this time, you do it that way. If you want to, if you want to look at the, you know, if you want to look at the commentary about this, if you want to say some other prayers, if you want to follow strictly, you know, the readings, the prayers, do it that way. Your active participation, your full conscious and active participation in Mass will be enriched by those things. And maybe, who knows, your your angels or the, the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do it this way one time and this way another time. You know, relax. That is surely a, a misconception about the Latin Mass for people who have never been right is probably that it is more rigid. Um, and it's, it's just... Striking to me how that is the opposite. It's really rigid for the priest. <laughs> oh, well, sure, sure. I mean, but for the, for the, the lay people, people that's yeah. right. participation in mass may look differently. And I yeah. think that there's something more. And, uh, and, so, and she, can I just add that the root, you know, that the directions in the, in the red missile, in the red book are customs. Mm -hmm. You do it differently in Rome than you do it in the United States. Exactly. You know, it's that that's that people think, oh, it's on the page. Well, therefore, I have to do it this way. No, actually, no, you don't. <laughs> um, that's someone's, you know, idea about how it was done, and it turned into a kind of a customary thing. And and indeed, in the in the genesis of that red book, uh, when they, I've heard the story about how that thing came about, and one of the priests that they were working with to, to put it together was going by his memory of how things were being done. And he may have just gotten a few things wrong. But now there they are, and they're kind of the customary <laughs> way of doing it. And okay, well, that's, that's all right, too. Now. Yeah, but you know, there are no real rubrics, um, mm -hmm. significant rubrics for lay people in the older form of mass. You know, if you want to stand, you want to kneel, you want to walk over and look at a statue you can you know do that too and Change it's like our eastern statue. brothers and I sisters do this that. you know once in a while yeah and sometimes i find i'll i'll be you know something in the introit or the offertory prayer will stick out to me and i'll just be sitting with that for the rest of the mass yeah and i, I you don't need to be tracking with every single word um because it's it it's a lot of it's in silence and and that that's a, one of the great glories of the latin mass all right so we're we're at our time, and I, I want to give a shout out to Angela and Father Z, um, and send you to the right place, which we didn't do in our intro. So, Angela, uh, how can people get in touch with you and see what you're all what you're doing? Yes, so um, I'm on Instagram. Our Roman Roots is the handle, and then I also have a website collaboration with a couple of colleagues of mine. That's RomanRoots.com. Our Roman roots, there it is. Yes. You know, actually, I should have known because I looked up some. I looked up Roman roots on Instagram, and it was like a dude, just like not very, not very many followers. And I was like, <laughs> who? I, I and I, I didn't uh, think to change it. I, I don't have an Instagram. I don't really understand it <laughs> sometimes. But yeah, there it is. Our Roman roots. Oh, follow Angela. Uh, she's doing great work. Come, she comes highly recommended. <laughs> and then Father Z, how can you? Uh, how can people get in touch with you? See what you're doing. Well, um, you can. Probably the best thing to do is just go to fatherzonline.com. Um, I uh, post on on Twitter occasionally, um, although I think we are all beginning to understand how really corrosive that environment can be. Um, yeah. I, I still use it for, for this and that, but you just come to the blog, you know, just let's keep it easy. That's why I, I changed the name of the thing from what does the prayer really say, which was the name of the column in the wanderer many years ago. When I stopped writing that column, I'm thinking, why is the blog to have this, you know, terribly difficult 
you know, name. So I turned it into Father Z's blog to make it obvious what it is. <laughs> That's Keeping good. it simple is sometimes a good idea. Father Z's blog. If you if you look me up online, you are also going to find a lot of people who really hate me. Mm. So uh, it's alternately frustrating and entertaining. Uh, if the world is against you, remember it that it was against me. Yeah, if, you, if they're not shooting at you, you're not over the target. <laughs> That's great. Um, so we Mass of the Ages is in production currently. Uh, wrapping up production. We've been to like, 10 states. Uh, again, we're doing a documentary on the Latin Mass. It's an introduction to the Latin Mass. It's also an investigation into the Concilium, which implemented the new Mass, uh, the changes to the new Mass. And the best way to get in touch is to go to our website, click Get Notified, and then enter your email address. And uh, that way you don't have to worry about you know YouTube or Facebook or anyone else um, banning us or whatever for being, uh, rad trads or whatever. I don't know what's going to happen, but emails, 